Welcome to a Parallel Project Training APM Project Management Qualification Podcast based on the APM Body of Knowledge 6th edition. You should be using this in conjunction with our e-learning, study guide and potentially a tutor-led course. For more information, please visit www.parallelprojectstraining.com. Hello, welcome to this Parallel Project Training podcast with John Bolton and Paul Neighbour, and we're working our way through the APM Project Management Qualification, formerly known as the APMP. That's right. And uh, we're up to estimating techniques. Hooray! Um, explain estimating techniques, explain the reasons and benefits of re-estimating throughout the project lifecycle, and the concept of the f- estimating funnel. Let's, let's start with the estimated funnel. Yes, then we'll explain why it doesn't you work. You clearly don't understand it. I clearly don't. You clearly don't. What the estimated funnel means <laughs> is that as you go through a project, your level of uncertainty decreases about what the final cost was going to be. As the level of information As rises. the level of information rises. And it's that rise in so, information. Like you need a degree to work that out, right? The more you know about something, the only time you know how much something's going to cost is just after you finished it. Right? Uh-huh. which is a fact lot of good. It's not, that's not project management. Project management is about trying to predict how much it's going to cost. Uh-huh. So or you, several days later. So you worry about it beforehand yes. rather than after it's too late. Yes. Okay. So you can only manage things you haven't done yet. Everything yes. else is accountancy, right? So you go through a project, and as you've got a bunch of data, so you make um, valuations on the estimates of how long this job's going to take based on the data that you have. As you get more data, so you refine that understanding. And uh, the hypothesis is is that as you go through time, your estimating accuracy improves. Mm -hmm. Mm. Now, estimates are always inaccurate because I love the... uh, That's the definition of an estimate. Yeah, well, no, yeah. Do you see what approximate means in the Oxford English Dictionary? No. Approximate means um, um, wrong, but close enough to be useful. (laughs) (laughs) Approximation to the cost. I think that's a good good description of a project estimate. Are we talking about cost or time or both? Both. Both. Well, also and also conformance to quality, I suppose, because mm. anything anything's negotiable, isn't it? You okay. know, you might not actually be able to do, you might not be able to get that final last little bit of the specification, mm-hmm. might you? Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. you're building a ship, and you, part of your quality criteria is it does 35 knots, as you build the ship, you might realise it's never going to do 35 knots. Is that estimating? Is that part of the estimate? The well, you've, you've, knots. Yes, you've estimated how fast it'll go. Okay. Haven't you? They've specified a requirement and you've estimated that what you're doing will satisfy mm-hmm. the requirement. Mm. Okay. It's normally cost and time. Okay. It's normally cost and time. So this thing, so explain to me. So I understand how... Um, the, so what we're saying is when we make an estimate at the beginning, it's sort of plus 75, minus 25% accurate. According. I don't understand that, though, because they always go up. It's not saying they go up. The, the, the initial estimate is always usually an it's, underestimate. It's, 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 not a, it's not a value. That curve is not a value. It's a percentage. Yeah, it's okay. It's a percentage of accuracy. So what I'm saying, when I give an initial estimate, I could be, the true cost could be 75% higher or, or 25%, 25% less. lower than that, yeah. But it's always higher. Given that, no, no, but the datum here is, is, the, ex, is the final value. Okay. So that curve, that dotted line in the middle might rise. Okay. In in numbers terms, but yes. if you imagine you've got a rising curve, but the funnel is closing around it. Okay. You with me? Yes. So your uncertainty about what, what it is okay. is reducing. So that straight line was confusing. It's, no, no, it's not suggesting that that is a, a numerical value. It doesn't say that anywhere. Why was you confused about that? I don't know. It's obvious. Um, but that's so, and the dot ends at some point in the future. Mm-hmm. So that point, you've got that uncertainty around Uh it and as you get towards the end of it you can see from that curve you've got plus 10 minus 5 something like that yes so you've got a 15 percent potential for error Uh and that's at the end of development Uh okay so i mean i've put those in the bottom there because i just wanted to map it onto the The life cycle cycle, really i wouldn't get too hung up about the detail i mean don't if you're reading the book don't worry about learning the numbers on here Oh, it's, you mean it's not in, no. It's not intended to be something that you have to memorise. The principle uh-huh. is that our ac- accuracy improves over time yes, okay. as a function of the information that we have. Yes, not okay. as a function of time going by. No, that's right. So, why is it so difficult to produce estimates? I think we said next, didn't we? Well, because it's, it's guessing, isn't it? Really? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> we don't know. Guessing. You don't know. Winston Churchill, wasn't it? He said, uh, "What was it?" 
experience is that wonderful commodity you obtained shortly after you needed it. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, they're subjective. They're always subjective, aren't they? They have assumptions in them. Yep. You don't know who's actually going to do the work, so you might assume that you're going to do the work when... It's difficult to plan it on basis of somebody else because you don't know who that somebody yes. else is. Yeah. This is a common one because you might you might plan, I don't know, you might plan an activity for three years' time. You don't know, got no idea who's going to do it. Yes. You know, and the person... Or what labour rate is going to apply. They, or whether they're going to apply the same um, estimates or they're going to do it the same way. You might mm-hmm. have different technological mm-hmm. ways of doing it. You might not be able to do it the way you wanted to do it. You might make, you know, it's, it's huge uncertainty. And I think that's one of the main problems, really, not knowing who's going to do it. And um, or you could, yes, or the risks to it, or they might not have any previous data. Yes, I mean, if you've done it lots of times before, then you should have some benchmark yeah, data. But you can't build a bridge to find out how long it's going to take to build the bridge. Yeah, it's really hard if you think about it in relationship to the optioneering and mm. requirements management. But that's, I think that's the most difficult. But once you know what your preferred option is, it's it's a lot easier to get a good estimate when you're yeah. still looking at the different options. It's well, it the trouble, yeah, you know, the trouble is it costs a huge amount of money, doesn't it, to get right, get the estimates to right. get. That's right, because you have to do all that design yeah. and you have to do that's some right. requirements capture that's and right. that's right. As, so you, as you as you get more and more information about the project in a desire to reduce the uncertainty, yes, that all costs money. Yes, and you can end up burning, you know, the equivalent of the project budget just to get the estimate right. Yeah. yeah. So you, there comes a point where you just say, "Well, look, just let's just get on with it," because. <laughs> You know, we live with this uncertainty. But that kind of, that that uncertainty going into the sort of definition phase of around about plus or minus 30%, it's not, probably, it's not uncommon, you know. No. I see that some of, the, some of our clients have got those sort of frameworks in place, haven't they? Mm-hmm. But then once you get into, you know, sort of within two accounting periods at the end of the project, you'd expect your forecast to be fairly accurate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, anyway. Good. So there's a couple of techniques we can use to help us um, produce this estimate. And actually, I think we use all of these techniques. That's right. In combination, bits, yeah. different bits. We would do a so a comparative estimate is a fairly rough and ready comparison to a similar project that That's you right. did. Usually, at least sometimes got a wet finger estimate. You know, just yeah. they call it analogous as well, don't they? Analogous is mm. the American term. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, you probably start with that. You say, well, last time we did this, it cost us X million pounds. So this That's time right. it's going to cost us about the same. And you can't not do it. No. It's, it's inherent. It's intrinsic. It's, so these aren't, these are all, they're not mutually exclusive. No, you can't not. If you're going to build a house and you've, you know, you if you're a house builder about- and you're going to build a three bedroom house on an estate. Yes. Same design as that one. That one cost 140 grand. This one's cool. Let me think. That's going to cost about 140 grand. grand. Yes. You can't not do it. Yes. So, but I mean, and sometimes having set that expectation, it's very difficult to shake it because, you know, and, and the problem is, it's not what it's not what the estimate was for the last one. It's what was the actual for the last one. Yes. So when you have comparatives, you might have estimated it at 140,000, but if it actually turned out 160,000, that should be your estimate for your next one. Yes. yes. Or you need to understand why it was different, you know. So the other way is, is bottom up using the usually the word breakdown structure. Yeah, that's but that implies that you've done some design and you know what the components, what the products are that you're going to use. So so that, that sort of comes along later, really. And I think this can be dangerous at an early phase if you haven't actually developed the concept mm. in much detail, but you can, can sort of con yourself that you've broken yeah. it all down, then um, you, you can believe, you believe your own PR, really, in terms of yeah. the quality of the estimate you've got. You do sometimes see this. It, it depends... If you've got like one level and you've got design, build and test. Yes. And you know that you've got a million quid. <laughs> you just sort of spread you the say, million well, quid out. <laughs> 30% of it's design, 40% yes. of it's, you know, so that's not really bottom up. No. That's just, that, that's cool. that's top down actually. That's sort of splitting it up according to percentages. But So bottom up is breaking it into all the components and pricing uh, up each uh, component yeah, separately. Individually, yeah. So you have to know every single little bit of detail. It costs yeah. a lot of money yes. to do that. Yes, yes. And each subcomponent would be a work package, I guess. Yeah, that's right. I should put that out there, really, shouldn't I? That's right, that's right, that's right. I mean, um, one way of doing the most common way, actually, of doing that is to get um, providers to give you prices for each of these components. That's right. So yeah. that's an underpinned estimate, really. That's so right. basically, you've got contracts that back that mm. estimate up. But they might be doing comparative estimates to give you a bottom up. They might bottom be. Up, they yeah. might be. But then if I've got a fixed price contract, but then it depends on the assumptions and risks That's and everything right. else, therein yeah, yeah. lies the game. 
And then you get parametric. Now, yes. Clues in the title, really. A number of param- parameters for which I have a metric or number. Yes. So I have a number of things that each cost a certain amount of money. Or... Each plug socket's a tenner. Therefore, yes. ten plug sockets, 100 quid. But that might be used... That might be a bottom-up, though. That might be a bottom-up. Ten plug sockets. So I might use... That's unit rates, isn't it? So I might use... Parametric is where there's a key parameter that uses to estimate the cost. So it's a key cost driver. So you're right, if you're wiring a house, for instance, yes. then one, one way of doing that is to just count the number of plug sockets That's right. and say it's £200 per plug socket. That's right. It's not the plug socket costs £200, but it's just a parameter that you can use to estimate how complex the right. wiring job is. Mm. I had a bloke rewire this house. He said it's five bedrooms, therefore it's 400 quid. <laughs> I go, well, that's a fantastic deal. Yes. <laughs> you know, because this house is all over the place, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was a poor parametric model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but it's not a unit rate. It's not um, so much per unit, per se. Um, the best well, I, don't, I don't understand that. Parametric is, I have a number of parameters for which I have a number. If the parameter happens to be a plug socket, and I have a value for that plug socket, that's a parametric estimate. But it's not the value for that plug socket. It's the effect of that plug socket on the overall project cost. So it's, a, it's an all-in rate. So it covers the wire, covers the channeling, covers the drilling. So that one parameter determines... But that just means that your parameter's bigger. Yeah, yeah. So you, yeah, yeah. Your, param- your, your, your plug socket includes the wiring. So the most common one used is, is, is square metres for a house. That's right. So it's four thousand pounds per square meter. That's right. So your parameter is the nu- is the number of square meters. Yes. And your metric is your price per square meter. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's correct. Yeah. So that's you. Correct. That's right. But this isn't. But it don't, you don't break it down so much per brick or per. Then you get three point estimating. Yes. Which is looking at the best case, most likely worst case, and combining them using some uh, a pert equation. I'm happy for you to describe this to me because I, I find this quite odd. Why? Well, because it says best case, most likely, worst case. Yes. Do you ask someone what the best case, most likely, and worst case is? What I have done in the past is I interview people and yes. I usually do it on assumptions. But do you ask them what their best case, yes. most likely, and worst case is? Yes. Okay, and so you ask one person for three, three the numbers. Work package manager. You so ask one account- person for three numbers. Yes. Okay. The account manager for the person accountable for the delivery of that work package. You go to them and say, "What's the best case? What's the worst case? Okay. What's the most?" So funny? you wouldn't ask three people for the same estimate. That would be a sort of Delphi technique. Okay. So you can. There's another technique called Delphi estimating. But that's in risk management, not in estimating. Yes, but you can use that for estimating too, but, but not, not in the APM. <laughs> <laughs> so it can't be right then. Um, you see, I, 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 I'm not as sure I'd fully, fully get to grips with the PERP business either. Okay, the, the, the four times the most likely plus the best case and worst case. PERT is a, is a particular form of um, distribution curve, yes. probability curve. Yes. And it just so happens, so Gaussian normal distribution is number one. Yes. And it just so happens that the statistics for a PERT curve turn out to give you that weighting. If you were to use a Gaussian curve, you'd get different different weightings. Okay, but the, it, uh, some guys some ends... guys invented the PERT technique years ago, mm. and and that's a simplification of what you do in Monte Carlo modelling. Yes, yeah, so this, it's, I, I, it's a poor man's Monte Carlo, really. It's a very simplistic view, isn't it? Because yes. it gives you a single point given three input Correct. parameters. Correct. But if you've got um, it, when I ever try and do it, it always comes out more or less around the most likely. Yeah. Well, I think PERT originally, you, you also combined the worst case, worst case, worst cases using um, square roots. So it not only told you what the overall yeah. best estimate was, but it also gave you an yeah. indication of the worst yeah. case. But most people do that with, yeah. with Monte Carlo. Start to use to live with all that, really. It's quite useful sometimes. When? With R&D. When, when there's so much uncertainty that you can't... You can say, well, this could take us between three months and six months, and honestly, I don't really know. But at least that lets you to come up with a, a range mm. of estimates. So you can go to the sponsor and say, well, we think this development might take between two years and three years. Yeah. So 
basically all they need to know for the exam is the principles of three point. They don't need to understand all that Gaussian nonsense. No. No. And then you've also got this business about the one plus four plus one over six, which is the per equation. Per equation. Based on our assumption, it's per. So if they answer a question on that, it's a really good idea to write it down because mm -hmm. it's probably looking for that. Good. Okay. Great. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and found it informative. To order a study guide, e-learning, or a tutor-led course to go with this podcast, please visit www.parallelprojectstraining.com.